this morning. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead. We'll be muting if you're not talking. So Michelle, if you want to go ahead and get started. All right, thank you. So hi, everyone, and welcome to EMI Live today, uh, where we're going to have a discussion starting with a large incidentally discovered intra-abdominal mass. What could have been done better? So thank you, Dr. Lee, for suggesting such an interesting case. I'm hoping it can generate some discussion on how we approach this rare condition and look for ways we could have done better by this patient. So we start with a 37-year-old woman who presented to the Avon ED with abdominal pain in late October of 2021. So she's had some vague lower back pain for over a year for which she saw her PCP and has been taking as needed NSAIDs and or Tylenol. Unclear if it's related, but now she's having abdominal pain for the past two weeks. It is left-sided and mostly left upper quadrant, and it's associated with bloating. The pain itself is dull and gradually worsening, now up to eight out of 10 in severity. She also feels like there's a hard mass in her left abdomen that um, is developing, but she is currently distended and tender and prefers not to press. She uh, endorsed her abdominal pain to her PCP, who referred her to GI, and just like last week, she had an EGD, which was unrevealing. She believes that she may have celiac disease, though the biopsies did not support this, and so she started on a gluten-free diet with no effect. This is also associated with six months of feeling severely fatigued. So the ED gets a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast, which reveals a suprarenal mass. It's presumed that it's a adrenal mass, though it does not have the typical adrenal appearance, as we'll show in a moment. The mass is 14 centimeters in its large in, largest dimension. There's also retroperitoneal adenopathy and multiple long lesions that are noted. There's no prior abdominal or lung images to compare to. Thus, she is admitted to Avon, and the endocrinology consultation team is requested to uh, work up her adrenal mass uh, hormonal workup. So from a review of systems, she has multiple other symptoms that uh, are a clue to her condition. So she does not recall any weight changes, but from her chart, we can see that she has gained about 13 pounds in the past year. She notes ballooning and rounding of her face with a clear difference seen in photos over eight months ago. She's having excess dark hair growth on her face uh, for which she has to shave daily. She also has noticed it on her arms and her back and her stomach, and this is all new. She also has noticed facial flushing and her lower extremities appear swollen to her. Her menstrual cycles have been irregular for the past 10 years or so. She was never diagnosed with anything like PCOS. She did have a child successfully 10 years ago, but she notes for the past year, they've been even more irregular and heavy. And so she recently trialed OCPs with her OB-GYN to see if there was any improvement, but there was not. So she had stopped the OCPs. She doesn't offer that her voice has deepened, but when you ask about it, she has noticed this. And she was acutely nauseous in the ED, but this resolves by the time that endocrinology comes to evaluate her. She denies any muscle weakness, skin changes like thinning or bruising or bleeding. There's no palpitations, diaphoresis, headaches, pallor, tremors, or fever. So from her medical surgical history, so she has a diagnosis of hypertension. It was diagnosed earlier this year. She's on an ARB and hydrochlorothiazide. GERD, she's been on uh, PPI for a couple of years. She also has generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. These are not new um, and are controlled by this point. It's not especially contributing to this particular presentation. She has never had any surgeries. From her family history, so there's a history of arthritis, breast cancer, colon cancer, and a paternal grandfather, and a relative with a stroke. From her social history shows, she's a current smoker, only about a quarter pack of cigarettes per day. And she denies alcohol or illicit drug use. She has worked full time in a factory for the past eight years. She is divorced and now living with her fiance and her 10 year old son who is healthy. And from her medications, I mentioned these for her high blood pressure this past year, she's been on Losartan and hydrochlorothiazide. And then for her acid reflux for a couple years, she's been on pantoprazole. From her physical exam, so her blood pressure is elevated at 145 over 92. Her vitals are otherwise fairly unremarkable. She is overweight with a BMI of 27. So she's well appearing Caucasian woman. She has facial plethora and hirsutism with stubble around her mustache and beard distribution. Um, other notable findings, she does not have any dorsocervical or supraclavicular fat pads. 
Uh, her abdomen is distended and firm. It is non-tense, but it is tender to palpation. And then thick, dark hairs are noted periumbilically. There is striae, um, though I don't know what color it was at the time. And then her mood and affect are appropriate. So we go ahead and get some initial laboratory tests. To start off looking at the electrolytes, we see that the potassium is low um, at 3.3. There's also normal renal function. The A1C was checked, so I include it here as 6.1%. So a hormonal workup was ordered by the endocrine consultant. So here on the left, we have the cortisol levels. You'll notice that these were obtained first thing in the morning rather than at midnight. This is not a dexamethasone suppression test result. Uh, but we also do have the 24-hour urine-free cortisol that was elevated. You can see the DHEAS and 17-hydroxyprogesterone uh, were elevated, and they also checked the aldosterone and renin. And then here on the right, we have the testosterone levels as well as the metanephrine levels. I'm going to pause here if uh, someone would be able to interpret these results for us. So I would say she has evidence of hypercortisolism and um, hyperandrogenism. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Lily. And so, it's all right. adrenal. And, it, and it's adrenal. Exactly. So she's got evidence of two adrenal hormones that are elevated, but no evidence of a pheochromocytoma or aldos primary aldosteronism. So I mentioned that she had a CT of her abdomen um, in the emergency room. So here's a sampling of the axial, coronal, and sagittal slices from her CT abdomen and pelvis. This is done with IV contrast. Um, so since these are contrast enhanced, uh, they don't report Hounsfeld units. So you can see there's a large heterogeneous suprarenal mass, 14 by 12 centimeters, which is presumed adrenal in origin. There is mass effect and inferior lateral displacement of the left kidney with some hydronephrosis. There's mass effect also on the pancreatic body and tail and on the bowel. Um, you can't see them as well here, but there are multiple pulmonary nodules multi uh, measuring up to six millimeters in the right middle lobe of the lung. There's also retroperineal uh, adenopathy with several lymph nodes with internal load density that are suggesting necrosis. The largest lymph node they mention is in the left periaortic region and measures 12 centimeters in maximal diameter. And then the adenopathy encases the abdominal aorta. So as a final impression, we have this large left suprarenal mass favoring adrenal origin and metastatic retroperineal adenopathy with pulmonary nodules thought to be metastatic. So my next question for the group, okay, with these labs showing hypercortisolism and elevated testosterone, hyperandrogenism, and imaging for this patient, what would you do to work up this patient next? Michelle, did anyone examine this patient? Yes, seriously, no. seriously. <laughs> did yeah. someone examine this patient anytime in the last six months? Yeah, her, her primary care doctor had uh, examined her just a couple weeks prior, and she had herself noted that she had abdominal distension and a, a hard mass forming on her left side. Because I cannot believe this was not palpable and this was not noticeable at least four, three, four, six months ago. You're probably right. Okay. I just to say something about us, which is not very nice, I guess. But at this point in time, you go where the money is. As far as I'm concerned, the money is in this mass, and at some point in time, you're going to remove it. Any further investigation is going to be, you can. You can try and do it to find out how extensive it is, but this thing's got to come out first and foremost. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, I think Dr. Lee and Dr. Rao have joined us as well. Um, what would you do next? Well, uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, this is my patient. So I saw her at F20. But uh, I think uh, the consulting and the chronologist in Avon at that time saw the patient initially. Uh, 
So looking at the CT, I mean, this 14 centimeter mass uh, from the adrenal uh, area uh, with necrosis inside and uh, it co-secrete uh, cortisol and uh, uh, androgen, adrenal androgen. I mean, what else could it be, right? I mean, it's almost a pathognomonic for uh, ACC. So at this point, I actually would just uh, uh, start to uh, consult our endocrine surgeon uh, colleague and maybe get oncology involved and uh, see if this can be resected by any chance or uh, start chemo as a drug therapy. Uh, I don't think any other investigations is, need is needed at this point. I wonder what Dr. Rao thinks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for that. And um, I agree with you, and I really don't have anything else to add. Uh, other, I mean, uh, add other than what you just mentioned, that it needs to come out and we need endocrine surgery and oncology on board. Thank you both. So as Dr. Lee uh, mentioned, so this is a, a mass where we're pretty concerned about adrenal cortical carcinoma. So for those of us who are less familiar with this diagnosis, let's talk about how or why this appears pathognomonic. So your next step is gonna be guided in part by what you think the adrenal mass is. So let's take a, a moment to look at the features associated with the main types of adrenal masses. So features that can clue you in include the tumor size, it's attenuation on unenhanced CT, the tumor size change over time, it's location, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, and the hormones that are associated with it. So in the case of our patient, we obviously have a very large tumor size, which speaks against an adrenal cortical adenoma. The unilateral location and the cortisol and androgen excess speak most likely to an ACC, um, in which case we know that adrenal biopsy is not particularly helpful, and I'll get uh, into that more in a moment here. So let's talk about when an adrenal biopsy is indicated. So first off, there are a variety of methods of percutaneous percutaneous biopsy, there's ultrasound guided, CT or MRI guided, and then there's also endoscopic EUS FNA, which I'm not going to go further to distinguishing those here. But we know from the European Society of Endocrinology and the European Network on the Study of Adrenal Tumors, we are guided to limit uh, adrenal biopsy procedures to patients with indeterminate <laughs> adrenal findings. So those with uncertain but concerning features particularly when there is a high suspicion that the adrenal mass is a metastasis from another primary. So in fact, the most common reason that adrenal biopsy is pursued is a suspected adrenal metastasis from an extra adrenal primary source. It can also be helpful for identifying infiltrative disease or infection, particularly if the patient has a history of systemic granulomatosis, or infection symptoms, and a lack of discrete adrenal mass. The majority of adrenal biopsies are ordered by oncologists and pulmonologists, and only 10% uh, are ordered or requested by endocrinologists. So we're really the minority ordering these. So in looking at the criteria, you need to start with an indeterminate mass. So it has to have features that are concerning for malignancy, like Hounsfeld units greater than 10 on a non-contrast CT. Uh, also can have absent MRI chemical shift concerning PET features or rapid tumor growth. Next, it is required that you do an initial biochemical evaluation at minimum needed to exclude catecholamine secreting tumors. So we know that biopsy of pheochromocytomas has been associated with serious consequences, such as hypertensive crisis, hemorrhage, seeding, uh, or mortality, uh, though these may not occur as often as feared based on some small studies that have looked at uh, these patients' outcomes. If there are any adrenal hormone uh, excesses, some would say not to do a biopsy because then you know that the tissue, tissue is adrenal in origin and it's not metastatic from another tumor. So biopsy does have a hard time distinguishing between adrenal tumors. For example, adenoma and carcinoma appear similar on biopsy. So the purpose of the biopsy is often to identify the type of tissue if you don't know that it's adrenal. The final criteria in deciding for, to do a adrenal biopsy is to look for how the findings will alter your clinical management, like in deciding between operative management for limited disease versus chemotherapy for metastatic disease. And um, why do we try to avoid these biopsies if we don't need to do them? Well, there are some complications, roughly about 2% can have bleeding, pain, pneumothorax, less commonly hypertension, nausea, or pancreatitis. 
Uh, when biopsy is not indicated, other forms of evaluation may include interval imaging, PET scan, or just going directly to surgical resection. So given that we suspect this patient has ACC from the prior slide, um, the ESC and the ENSAT would recommend against biopsy. Now, why do we say that? There are histologic challenges in differentiating ACC from a degenerated adenoma. There's a lower diagnostic accuracy uh, with biopsy for ACC. The sensitivity is only about 70% based on systematic reviews. Pathologists struggle to differentiate between benign adrenal mass from, AC from ACC, even when the entire tumor is available for review, let alone when you're doing a small biopsy where there might not be enough tissue to perform the Weiss scoring, which is how they make the diagnosis um, on histology. There's also a concern for seeding along the needle track this, there's overall low risk, but cases in literature do document that this can occur. And then for suspected ACC, generally we should go directly to adrenalectomy. The exception is of course, if the mass is inoperable and you think that the findings of a biopsy will guide the oncology treatment decision. So I think at this point, most of us would most likely not pursue an adrenal biopsy for this patient given her most like, likely diagnosis is ACC. Nevertheless, the team at the time, specifically the oncology team, did order a CT-guided core biopsy of her left adrenal mass. The results showed a tumor cell necrosis, high mitotic activity with marked uh, cytologic atypia, and elevated KI67 uh, proliferation percent. There was also a strong nuclear expression for SF1, and there was no PAX8. So the pathologist specifically remarks that this is difficult to fully assess. Uh, and it's hard to diagnose ACC in a needle core biopsy because not all the, the features that they look for are present in that kind of biopsy. But the, what we can see is consistent with ACC. And so the diagnosis is, is made officially here. So the WISE criteria is how they make this diagnosis from histology. Three or more criteria is consistent with ACC. And I'll just show it here briefly. Um, you can see that from her necrosis, mitosis, atypia, and proliferation, these are all highly consistent features for ACC. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about ACC because uh, this is a new uh, case for me. It's in part because these tumors are very rare. Uh, there's a very low incidence of about 0.5 to 2 cases per million people per year. It accounts for about 1% of incidentally found adrenal masses. Uh, there's a bimodal distribution and it's mostly people in their first and fifth decades of life and the median age is 55. It affects women slightly more often than men. Uh, the majority are sporadic, but about five to 10% are syndromic. The only known risk factor uh, behaviorally is smoking, like our, our patient does have a smoking history and is slightly more often left-sided than right-sided. The median tumor size is 10 to 12 centimeters and the largest reported is 28 centimeters. Bilateral is extremely rare as are ectopic sites. So the etiology, um, there's some evidence for adenoma to carcinoma progression. It is thought that IGF-2 is the main oncogene and there are many uh, genetic mutations that are considered drivers. So I just have a list here of mutations which have been associated with ACC. I think probably the most memorable on this list here is uh, Lee Pramani syndrome. And why do I say that? Uh, there was a study in Brazil uh, where one uh, town had the highest known incidence of childhood ACC. And they found that it was because this town specifically had a, a larger percentage of this Lee Fermani a genetic mutation, but you can see it can be associated with uh, a number of different genetic uh, syndromes. For those of you who are giving the boards, these genetic syndromes are important and you're often tested on them. So make sure to know what are the various components of the genetic syndromes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So symptoms from ACC can come from hormone secretion or from mass effect. So about 50% of adrenal cortical carcinomas are functional. Most often, if they secrete, it is cortisol, and there will be a rapid clinical onset of Cushing syndrome. The next most common are sex hormones, mainly the androgens that cause hirsutism, virilization, and menstrual irregularities. Aldosterone is the least common uh, hormone secretion. Up to a quarter of these tumors are mixed. 
Functional tumors are seen more often in young female patients with metastatic disease like our own. So these tumors often displace and invade adjacent organs such as the kidney, the liver, and the pancreas, or the adrenal vein, vena cava, and retroperitoneal area. So a number of these also present with a mass effect, which could be GI symptoms, organ compression, back pain, or even mimicking infectious processes because of the cytokines that can be released from highly necrotic tumors. So that can cause localized pain and fever. Only about 10% are discovered incidentally um, during unrelated imaging procedures. If they do metastasize, the, mo the most common sites are the liver, lymph nodes, and lungs, but also can metastasize to peritoneal and pluritic, or pleural spaces, bone, skin, um, and then brain is very rare, but also been reported. So like other forms of malignancy, the tumor stage is decided by its size and how invasive it is. So less than five centimeters is stage one, greater than five is T2. If there's local invasion, it's T3, and adjacent organ involvement, T4. So why does stage matter so much? Well, it uh, greatly changes the prognosis. So T1 has a good survival rate of about 82% for five years. But as you get to a disease with distant metastasis, your five-year survival rate drops down to about zero to 18% at five years. Particularly bad prognostic markers include hypercortisolism, an older age greater than 50 years, high mitotic activity, a KI67 percentage with angio invasion. So treatment briefly, first and foremost is surgery, just like Dr. Maida, Dr. Lee, Dr. Rao all mentioned, uh, resection is really mainstay. This person needs to be seen by a surgeon if possible. Um, oh. Sorry, I think something just took over my screen. Sorry, we're just having some technical difficulties Our here. Our computers have also decided they don't like the snow blizzard outside, <laughs> which we are having. <laughs> so uh, give us a minute and we advance to the slide. Um, while we are getting there, um, we have Dr. Amir Hamrayan on. Dr. Hamrayan is a world-renowned expert and our next speaker as well. Dr. Hamrayan, welcome and thank you for logging in. Do you have any thoughts on the case so far? Dr. Ryan, can you hear me? All right, while we wait for Dr. Ryan to go on, we shall go ahead. All right. Um, so, in resuming, so we were just talking about how radical resection is the mainstay of therapy, if possible. It can also be done with lymph node dissection and excision of solitary lung lesions. Uh, radiation is also an option adjuvantly or for unresectable tumors, and it's particularly effective for bone lesions. Mitotane is the main drug therapy that is used, and uh, if you're going to do systemic chemotherapy, it's usually EDPM, which is cisplatin, doxorubicin, and etoposide with mitotane. The dosing is based on uh, NCCN, and the mitotane specifically is based on the FIRM ACT trial. There can be really severe toxicity and side effects like nausea, and that's to be expected. So mitotane has to be taken with lipid-rich food. The dosing starts low and gradually increases each week. Another option is immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, or other targeted therapies such as sunitinib, cement inhibitors, uh, IGF-1 inhibitors, and so on. And so those are all options as well. So with this in mind, let's return to our patient's case. So first, she's evaluated by endocrine surgery, uh, Dr. Berber and his team, and she is deemed not to be a candidate for surgical reception. 
So next she is referred to oncology. A PET CT and CARIS or genetic counseling and testing are ordered for the future. Oncology begins her on palliative chemotherapy with EDP and mitotane in mid-November. Uh, given that her high or her urine free cortisol is very, very high, it is recognized that she may be slower to respond to the mitotane. However, in anticipation of um, adrenal insufficiency that will develop on the mitotane, they do start her empirically on hydrocortisone 20 milligrams in the morning, 20 in the afternoon, and 10 in the evening. So I'll pause here to open it back up to our audience and panelists. Do you agree with this treatment plan? Is there anything that you would add or remove from uh, what they're doing for this patient? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dr. Hamrayan, if you are back in, uh, do you have any thoughts on the case? What do you think of the treatment plan so far? You're muted in case you're trying to speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Welcome. Good, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, you know, Cleveland is uh, is my home, and uh, my heart is with Cleveland Clinic. So um, I just it's a it's a great pleasure to um, to be here and and uh, listen to Dr. Meda. I don't know if he still stands at the back of the um, conference room or or maybe maybe this, the, maybe this is the virtual one. Anyway, I enjoyed listening to this case. Uh, I had a few comments. Um, uh, I mean, as Dr. Lee, I think, mentioned, uh, when you have um, uh, two axis uh, hormone elevation here, the androgen and cortisol in the setting of an adrenal tumor, it's almost always uh, uh, ACC malignancy. Um, uh, our oncologists usually like to have a tissue biopsy, so I don't uh, blame them that they wanted to have. And then many times we go and get a tissue from um, a non-adrenal source where this is accessible from the lung or another lesion in the liver or, or lymph node um, and you, they can do immunostaining and then they can say this is by sure ACC so um, so that is usually is requested by, by the oncologist and um, the this unfortunate woman and um, has advances I, I was expecting that this would but would not be a surgical case uh, and that sounds like a, a endocrine surgery um, assessment is the same uh, we started people on hydrocortisone uh, when um, we start mitotain. Um, however, um, however, this patient with the unresectable disease and evidence of uh, hypercortisonism, probably that can be hold and the patient can be monitored in intervals. It may be too early for a patient who has already Cushing syndrome to start hydrocortisone right away. So I, I would not, in my, I would not be that my, my personal approach in this case. Uh, but in a patient, we even have rejected the tumor, we start like a one side, uh, or even they don't have an insufficiency, it was non secreting and we start the microtin. We have a low threshold to start a patient on 20 and 10, starting with and then adjust the dose. These people require higher doses. So that is one. Another thing important in this patient, don't forget about the anticoagulation. I, I did not hear about the UFC. But um, these people are at increased risk and they can die from the cancer, they can die from the PE uh, also. So you need to have a low threshold for that. Um, so um, that can be done and then even the later on can be changed to heparin, the patient can have surgery and then go back on the anticoagulation. Another thing is I think important, this patient had some mild hypokalemia, has excess cortisol hypertension. We have a low threshold to start in spinal lactin in these patients. So I think that should be part of the initial uh, treatment plan for this patient. Uh, PET CT uh, have some roles. Uh, I mean, here it's all over, so I'm not sure how much it's going to help you, but uh, it's an expensive test. But but usually that is done, uh, especially for patient who may want to do surgery, and then we are not sure the extent of the disease that uh, what I did not hear about KI 67. Um, anything above 10 percent is, is significant, but this patient probably have much more than that, uh, as it was very nice presentation by the fellow. Actually, I enjoyed that. Uh, you know, the elevated 20, 24 hour, uh, the the hypercortisolism, KI67. These are some of the the risk factors, and I think this patient probably uh, has that. Except that the age is is being on the on the low side. So that was my actually my thoughts about this case. Uh, so we would probably in this case do the the chemotherapy. I will start a patient on mitotain. Uh, I am a big believer in mitotain. Uh, and it is indicated nowadays we don't do it for the 
stage one and stage two, uh, but but we do it for stage three and four. So this patient would be qualifying for that all washed. And I'll, we probably need to have some treatment done toward the hypercortisolism too, based on the UFC. I mean, this patient, uh, there was um, Cushing very features on the exam. And that can be done with the, in addition to mitotain, which may be a slow acting, also you can use some other agents um, as a, um, um, the, the, the cortisol synthesis inhibitors, for example, can be used. Uh, the metarapone, um, uh, oscillodorostat, uh, mifepristone, all of these are medication that can be used and that can be discussed. So I would say going after the Cushing, uh, DVT, PE prophylaxis, hypertension control, chemotherapy, plus mitotain. And then these people can benefit from uh, surgery down the road once the tumor burden is low, lower. Uh, they can do have debulking surgery sometimes done, so you can decrease, the, especially if the hypercortisol is difficult to control. I'm going to stop here. I talk too much. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, Dr. Brian, thank you for that mini lesson in ACC. I do have a question since you uh, mentioned mitotain and hydrocortisone replacement. Once you start a patient on mitotain, and this is for other people on the call who don't necessarily do this very often, how often do you see them back or how often and how do you monitor them for need for hydrocortisone replacement or when to start them on hydrocortisone replacement? So in a patient who like this patient has the uh, hyper uh, cushing with features and I'm expecting to have high cortisol levels on the UFC too, um, I would uh, not start them from the beginning, as I mentioned. I would uh, evaluate them on a monthly basis initially and then, but in a patient who doesn't have a, hypercortisolism and we uh, has a normal, let's say, left or right adrenal gland, and I start to start the mitotain, I would start them on day one, actually, on 20 and 10 on hydrocortisone. Uh, so that is, and then I see them uh, once a month initially, and then after that, every couple of months, I watch the, um, uh, the mitotain level closely, uh, initially every month, and then after that, every couple of months, with the goal of getting the level between 14 and 20 as a, as a therapeutic range, and then go from there. All right. Thank you. I could not, I cannot not. I mean, if I hear Amir, I have to disagree with him. His voice <laughs> is so wonderful. Uh, Amir, wonderful to hear from you. But I would suggest to you that giving uh, 30 or 40 milligrams of hydrocortisone to someone who has uh, a ton of cortisol is probably just being in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and the reason I'm insisting that we give it is because you've had at least one case I know of where we had a successful therapy with mitotain. The patient was very uh, nicely sub cortisol suppressed, ended up in a peripheral non-clinic hospital in an ICU. They forgot to give him steroids, and I think he passed away because of adrenal insufficiency, not because of his primary disease. Giving people steroids bridges you when you can't look after them, when you're not completely in con control of the patient, and it's not going to hurt them by giving them some early on. You know, I always disagree with Dr. Mehta. What can I say? You know, he is in my heart. So, Dr. Mehta, I, I, I agree with you that the 30 milligram high because of small dose. Um, I don't think the case you're discussing uh, is apl applicable to this patient with this amount of the uh, extensive disease. Um, I do not uh, definitely have a hard uh, thought on this, that you should not do that, but I think I can very comfortably follow this patient and then monitor the patient and then include or add the hydrocortisone when the levels are coming down, even not normalized. I mean, even, even the levels, I mean, if the patient has a UFC of a, let's say 1,000 or 2,000 microgram per day, I mean, you're adding hydrocortisone on top of that and you say because it's a small amount, I mean, I, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the... I don't see the, the benefit of that, but I see your point. If you have a patient who is non-compliant, who is not reliable, and you are not going to be good, then so maybe, maybe that, that is reasonable. But I would say I can wait until I think it better and add that. But I, I respect your opinion, as I always do. Thank you. This is like old times. If uh, people here do not know, I was actually a fellow when Dr. Hemrayan was here, and I wrote my first manuscript as a fellow with him. So thank you, Dr. Hemrayan, for coming back to us. Um, you can share your presentation, Dr. Hemrayan. Uh, thank you.